financial decisions people make in this country whether to get a loan to buy a new house or car or to start up a company whether to expand a business by investing in a new plant or equipment and whether to put savings in a bank in bonds or in the stock market the object of monetary policy is to influence the performance of the economy as reflected in such factors as inflation economic output and employment while most people are familiar with the fiscal policy tools that affect demand such as taxes and government spending many are less familiar with monetary policy and its tools monetary policy is conducted by the federal reserve system the nation's central bank and it influences demand mainly by raising and lowering short term interest rates history of the us economy the fledgling 13 colonies established their independence on ingenuity the frontier and support from france and her allies the united states and national debt were born and both have expanded seemingly without limits once the world's leading economic superpower in the 20th century america assumed the role of financial capital of the world as america's trade deficit continues to increase much of america's massive debt is now controlled by china and a transfer of power seems to be in progress the economy of colonial america colonial america was a predominantly agricultural economy even as the economy expanded over the decades of the 18th century the colonies only inched towards industrialization by the year of the declaration of independence in 1776 the economy of the 13 original colonies was actually relatively stable in stark contrast to the 20th and 21st centuries dynamic economic expansion occurred with population growth from births and immigration but colonial americans had naturally become increasingly self-sufficient by 1776 The standard of living of free white American society was already high with abundant food and land supporting a comparatively high median income. The Constitution and Pre-Civil War Economy. From the writing of the United States Constitution in 1787, America's economy saw tremendous growth. The Constitution provided a kind of economic charter laying out regulation of both commerce and money by congress most importantly it opened the market of the united states territory open borders allowed for an internal free flow of goods and ideas washington wanted to encourage fledgling american industry in an era when 90% of her citizens were employed in agriculture most of whom made everything they needed to live on their own farms american government on the other side of the debate was america's first secretary of the treasury alexander hamilton hamilton and his federalist party were proponents of a stronger central government in order to encourage manufacturing and commerce as the core of the new american economy the first half of the 19th century saw a frontier opened by significant developments in transportation government built waterways such as the erie canal opened up new areas to westward settlers while improvements in water transportation most notably the steamboat allowed better movement in the mississippi river and her tributaries the america government by then however the united states economy had been hit by two major forces the california gold rush and the civil war the economics of war the 1848 discovery of gold in california not only drew hundreds of thousands of people out west it also shifted the balance of economic attention of the united states by the onset of the civil war in 1861 gold not only backed american currency but because of its role in northern industry it was indirectly a primary funder of the northern war effort elected in 1860 abraham lincoln and his republican party had northern industrial interests to preserve 
which led to the establishment of a new tariff on foreign goods in 1861. And because of the war, industry in the North further flourished. The industrial economy of the North would persevere. Reconstruction through the Roaring Twenties. Following the war, the South lay in economic shambles and the slave-supported aristocracy was dissolved as plantations were divided up. Tenant-style farming or sharecropping became the predominant form of southern agriculture, particularly among the recently freed slaves. By the Civil War, already a third of the national economy was powered by manufacturing, most of which was in the North. Following the war, the American economy was driven by innovation and invention that spurred tremendous growth of the industrial infrastructure. The 1917 War Revenue Act raised taxes while the government sold bonds to the general public and the newly founded Federal Reserve. At the time, America was clinging to a gold standard to back its currency, so avoiding simply printing additional money was meant to help preserve the standard while preventing inflation. Great Depression through World War II the two most influential economic events of the 20th century in America are the Great Depression and World War II. While the precise causes of the Great Depression are both numerous and challenging to pinpoint, the economic effects were disastrous. At its peak, unemployment was nearly 25% of the workforce, as hundreds of banks failed, about 40%, and hundreds of millions of deposits were lost. In summary, after increasingly stock speculation, the stock market crash of 1929 wiped out millions of investors and crippled confidence among business executives and consumers. Into the modern era, 1950s to present. While portions of Asia and Europe lay in literal ruins, the United States continued to grow after the war both in population and economically. The post-war baby boom was one of many results of the American military returning home. By now, the United States was the richest nation in the world. As a result, America was developing an extensive infrastructure to match its wealth. The completion of the interstate highway system remains the largest public works project in the history of the world. Understanding the recession, stock markets, subprime lending and bursting bubbles. In all, there have been over 30 cycles of expansions and recessions of the US economy just since 1854, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. When markets are surging, bubbles form out of wild speculation and over-evaluation that are based largely upon euphoria and greed. Electronic herds of investors are populated with optimistic or bull buyers. In 2000, the dot-com economic boom came to an end as interest rates rose and investments in technology slowed. When an economic bubble bursts, the herd became fearful. A pessimistic bear market is a seller's stock market in decline. Some of these economic forces were the same key factors that caused the subprime mortgage bubble that burst in late 2007. A history of central banking in United States. Nearly every country around the world and certainly every developed industrial nation most serve one or more of the following functions. Acting as a bank for bankers, issuing a common currency, clearing payments, regulating banks and acting as a lender of last resort for banks in financial trouble. But even though these central banks have common functions, each still operates in distinct ways and those distinctions largely stem from the bank's historical foundations. A New Nation, 1775-1790 to, to finance the American Revolution, the Continental Congress printed the new nation's first paper money. Known as Continentals, the notes were originally intended to be redeemable on demand in specie.
after the Revolutionary War ended, the nation had substantial debt, a significant portion of which was issued by the individual states. There was no common currency, as many states printed their own money. The First Bank of the United States, 1791 to 1811. The Constitution itself prohibited state governments from issuing their own currency. The Bank of the United States was conceived in 1790 to deal with the war debt and to put the government on sound financial footing. It was intended to help fund the government's debt and issue currency notes. The bank can be largely judged a success both in paying off war debts and in its commercial operations which were much larger than its public activities. The Second Bank of the United States, 1816 to 1836. With the War of 1812, federal debt began to mount again. At the same time, most state chartered banks which were issuing their own currency suspended specie payments. The Second Bank was similar in structure to the First Bank but bigger. It had capital of $35 million with the government again holding one-fifth of the shares. Like the First Bank, it was headquartered in Philadelphia. Over the time it operated, it had offices in 29 major cities around the country. Unlike the First Bank, however, the Second Bank was poorly managed at its outset and was on the verge of insolvency within a year and a half after it opened. Free Banks, 1837 to 1863. While there had always been state chartered banks in the United States, with loss of the second bank's charter, there was a need for more banking. Consequently, during the period from 1837 to the Civil War, commonly known as the Free Banking Era, states passed free bank laws which allowed banks to operate under a much less onerous charter. In addition, free banks were required to redeem their notes on demand in specie. As a result of the free banking laws, hundreds of new banks opened their doors and free bank notes circulated around the country, often at a discount. National Banks, 1863 to 1913. The outbreak of the Civil War and the need to finance it led again to a renewed interest in a national bank. But this time, with the lessons of the second bank, the designers took a different approach, modelled on the free banking system. In 1863, they established what is now known as the national banking system. The new system allowed banks to choose between a national charter and a state charter. With a national charter, banks had to issue government-printed bills for their own notes and the notes had to be backed by federal bonds which helped fund the war effort. The Federal Reserve, 1913 to present. In the intervening 70 years since the second bank closed, central banks in other countries such as England began to take on new roles. Their preferred status as the government's banker caused others to view them as more secure which led to their holding deposits and serving as a banker's bank. In designing the new bank, Glass and Willys took lessons from the first and second banks. They removed the private role of the bank in commercial lending so that the new bank would be a largely public institution. Profits in excess of cost were handed over to the US Treasury. International Trade International trade in goods and services, along with flows of financial capital, affect virtually every person living in the United States. Whether one buys imported clothes, gasoline, computers or cars, works in an industry that competes with imports, or sells products abroad, the influence of international trade on economic activity is pervasive. Since 1976, the United States had incurred continual merchandise trade deficits with annual amounts increasing steadily until the plateau of years 2005 through 2008. Then, in 2009, 
the US trade deficits on goods declined roughly 39% as US imports fell much faster than exports during the recession. As the economy recovered, the trade deficit began increasing again by 28% in 2010 and 15% in 2011. It provides an overview of the current status, trends and forecasts for US import and export flows as well as certain trade balances. The purpose of this report is to provide current data and brief explanations for the various types of trade flows. Most recent developments For January to July 2012, merchandise exports increased 6% over the same period in 2011, imports increased 5% and the US trade deficit with the world increased or became more negative by 2%. For the year 2011, US merchandise exports to the world rose 16%, US merchandise imports also rose 16% and the US trade deficit rose 15% from $645 billion in 2010 to $738 billion in 2011. The US top export commodity in 2011 changed from the historic top export of civilian aircraft, engines and equipment, which increased 11.4% from 2010 to refined petroleum products up 70%. Trade in goods. Export of goods of $1,497 billion in 2011 increased by $208 billion or 16% over the $1,289 billion in 2010. This places the growth in exports on track to achieve a doubling over the five-year period 2010-2015 a goal outlined in the President's National Export Initiative. U.S. exports and imports of goods began to decline in August 2008. This trend continued until exports of goods began to increase in May 2009 and imports began to increase in June. Exports have generally continued increasing since the end of the recession Imports also increased for much of that period, but have recently declined since March 2012. Trade in service In 2011, total annual imports of services of $427 billion and exports of $606 billion yielded a surplus in U.S. services trade of $179 billion. The U.S. service industries, particularly financial services, tourism, shipping and insurance, tend to compete well in international markets. U.S. services trade was also impacted by the global financial crisis, but to a lesser extent than goods trade. Regulation and control in the U.S. economy The U.S. federal government regulates private enterprise in numerous ways. Regulations fall into two general categories. Economic regulation seeks either directly or indirectly to control prices. Another form of economic regulation, antitrust law, seeks to strengthen market forces so that direct regulation is unnecessary. The government and sometimes private parties have used antitrust law to prohibit practices or mergers that would unduly limit competition. Government also exercises control over private companies to achieve social goals such as protecting the public's health and safety or maintaining a clean and healthy environment. Some citizens, meanwhile, have turned to the courts when they feel their elected officials are not addressing certain issues quickly or strongly enough. Government Economy Policy Incidence of Taxation and Expenditure The incidence of taxes is a subject that has generated much academic debate. It is usual to distinguish between the legal incidence of a tax and its effective or final incidence. The legal incidence is on the person or company who is legally obliged to pay the tax.
effective or final incidence refers to who actually ends up paying the tax. Whether the final incidence of the tax is on those who actually pay it depends on their market power relative to the people with whom they trade. Summary Understand the history of the US economy, explain the history of central banking in the United States, discuss on international trade, explain the regulation and control in the US economy, define government economy.